Economic expert Harry Dent Jr. says the housing market is in for the biggest downturn in history and we should expect home prices to drop 50%. Harry is actually a bear on the whole U.S. economy, and he believes that we're in the worst everything bubble, artificially stimulated, and everything is overvalued, and that it will all come crashing down. And we will be in the deepest downturn, actually a depression that will be far worse than the 2008 global financial crisis. So in my discussion, Harry breaks down why we're in this mess and what he expects to play out this year. That's 2024. Let's meet Harry. Harry Dunn, thank you so much for podcasting with me and speaking to our audience. I'm looking forward to our discussion here. You know, gas prices are back up. Food prices on average have never been worse than right now. And layoffs and job cuts are a reality for many. And it seems like the economy is finally slowing down. You're an expert on the economy and you've been successful predicting financial trends, especially economic troubles and downturns for decades. And uh, I mean, now, I mean, I think you believe we're in for a major downturn and we want to talk about what this means for average Americans. So we have a lot to unpack here uh, yeah. right now. But before we do, I just want you to explain to everybody who is Harry Dent Jr. You know, give us some professional background because I want people to understand that when you speak, they should listen. So why is it that they should pay attention to what your uh, predictions are? Well, I, I think that the most important thing is I'm not an economist. <laughs> I did major in economics in, in, in college. And after the third course, I said, I mean, there was one great course on how they create money out of thin air, which is the most important topic today. But, but other than that, I found it vague and conceptual. And so I took everything else in business. I took accounting and all my father's business friends, he was in politics, said, oh, gosh, we wish we'd studied accounting and finance. So I took that in undergrad. And then at Harvard Business School, I focused on marketing and management and the bigger picture stuff. And then after I got out of business school, I was basically doing a lot of turnaround management for, for new ventures in California. So, so I had stepped away from the Bain and Company, Harvard Business School, Fortune 100 into the new venture realm. And then I said, oh, here's the new economy. So I got all excited about that. And, and then I did my own research into history, looking for key cycles. And, and I mean, I literally went back and it, 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 was a, it was a giant volume of books called The History of Western Civilization by William Durant or something. It's a giant thing. Over seven or eight months, I went through that entire thing. And the one thing I could track was inflation. GDP wasn't even a word back then, okay? But inflation was, and, and inflation is always a, a leading indicator. It, in, inflation is like the cost of the investment, like raising a kid until they become productive. Same for the economy. Inflationary 70s, great boom in the 80s and 90s. Okay. So, so that inflation allowed me to check, to, to track all of modern, you know, history back thousands of years, not just hundreds. And so <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm really a cycle guy. Uh, and, and so, but, but what a cycle guy should tell you, and, and some of them don't, is whatever you're looking at, there's always a few key cycles that are important. If you look at too many cycles, you'll get confused, okay? And the, I, my, my Malutin Milankovic is my hero in the climate realm. He got it down to three long-term cycles, okay? Very long-term, but it came down to three. And that's what I've got, a, a, a demographic generational spending cycle, a technology innovation cycle. So one of them's on a 39-year clock, approximately. The technology's on a 45-year clock and is really the most powerful long-term. And then a geopolitical cycle that just says, hey, when are, when's the world geo, you know, geopolitically going to look better, which doesn't affect the growth as much, but affects the valuations of the stock market. So I've got these three indicators that do give me a long... I mean, I tell people, I can tell your kids what the economy is going to look like when they're at the peak of their career, when they're 40 something years old at the peak of their spending out in 2065, if that's where it is for them. And, 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 re and not be guessing, not, I mean, this is, in fact, my quote is the long term is actually more predictable than the short term in similar parameters. Okay. 
because the short term, just especially in recent times, ever since 2009, we've been living off a of nonstop printed money stimulus. This has never happened before. People think, oh, they must have done this in the Great Depression. No, they didn't. They didn't know that that was okay to just solve problems by printing money out of thin air. And of course, that doesn't solve problems. All it does is covers them over and makes them worse, which is the only reason, Todd, I'm bearish right now. We are we we saw the baby. I got famous for predicting the huge baby boom boom from 83 to 2007 right when it was just getting going in the mid to late 80s. I was saying this stuff and people say, what are you smoking, Harry? Don't you realize Asia and Japan are going to eat our lunch as far as we're inferior now and we don't have work ethic. You know, we have all these problems. I said, no, we have the biggest baby boom in the world and the most affluent. And they're going to be driving the economy in the 2007 greatest boom in history. And, and, and so now we've had the baby bus slow down, but the problem with that is starting in 2008, and by the way, I predicted 2008 would be a recession decades before it happened, not, not years or months, okay? Because this long-term peak in the generational cycle, okay? Well, what happened is they said, this time they said, well, wait a minute, Ben Bernanke studied the Great Depression. He was the Fed chairman at the time of this crash hit, and he saw 1930, same thing I saw the beginning of a Great Depression, of a major bubble bu bubble bursting and turning into a demographic downturn as it did from 1930 to 42, okay? So, but what happened, and, and this is really unique in history and, and hopefully will not be repeated again, governments took the easy way out. U.S. alone combined 19 trillion since 2008, since we went into that deep recession after the great boom, 19 trillion in nonstop deficits to stimulate the economy and $8 trillion in mo printing money out of thin air. So the deficits go more into economic and fiscal, what, the fiscal stimulus and the monetary goes direct into pumping up stock markets and bond markets and making financial assets more. So what we have in from 2008 to 2223 should have been a long slowdown like the 1970s and 1930s, okay? Instead, we got the greatest boom in stocks ever. Um, and, and now the millennials, just now, right now, Todd, the millennials are entering their boom, okay? From 2024, the first big surge into 2037. But we have massive amounts of debts we never cleared, which you only do in downturns. That's why downturns are necessary and good up to a point. And, and we have this giant financial asset bubble that never was allowed to burst. So I'm saying, I think that's going to happen. I think that may be just starting now. Why? Because the Fed so overreacted to COVID, um, which was a short-term crisis. Why blow all this stimulus that, that, that they had to turn around and tighten 525 basis points? That's the most since 80, 81, by the way. And that led to the deepest downturn since the Great Depression back then. And I think that this this tightening is just starting to hit and will hit into early next year. And only then can we judge. Everybody's saying, oh, the, the economy's taking well. No, no. It hits on about a year and a half lag. That's what people don't get. And that's what what what, what is the bane of the Fed. When they start doing all this over stimulus and over tightening, it keeps hitting for a year and a half. So even though they're already talking about easing in June, which has been put back from March, and already there's signs they're not going to even ease in June, okay? Um, even if they do that, the tightening they did into July of last year is going to hit into early 2025, almost a year from now. So I think the trends are down. I think stocks have peaked here. And I think we may just be turning down for the next year or so. But the good news is this is turning down and fly, finally clearing out a lot of debts and, 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 and bubble. Out. Bubbles are terrible. Money velocity is the only true measure of how the economy is doing. And money velocity has been dropping like a rock since 1998, just like it did from 2000, uh, I mean, 1997 into 1932 during the Roaring Twenties bubble and the Great Depression, okay? Falling money velocity means money's going into speculation and not solid investment that creates good returns, okay? Like we saw in the 80s and 90s and, 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 and 2000s. So, so money velocity is crashed the most ever. That bodes poorly. But 
My demographic cycle, the most important cycle I innovated, a 46 year lag, now 47 for the millennials, for the peak spending. And this is a fact. I'm, I'm projecting the economy based on fact. When the average person spends the most money and it's extremely accurate and is only going forward very slowly. That says we, we do have another boom coming, especially between about now and 2037, if we can let the economy clear out this debt and financial asset bubble. So that's, that's the trillion dollar question. <laughs> If the economy gets its way, and the economy is a lot smarter than economists, I'll tell you that, okay? I mean, I quit my economics major because I didn't even see anything hardly of interest there. So even a PhD doesn't do you much good in that realm from my point of view. That's why I studied everything else. But, but we do have the millennial boom ahead of us if we can just let the economy take a year or two to clear out the greatest, and I mean by far the greatest debt, and when you see a debt bubble, you will always see a financial asset bubble because more money comes in, not only for spending, but more money comes into a fixed pool of financial assets and drives them up. So big bubble burst, I think, in the next year or two. If it's going to happen, it should start, uh, I'd say, by, by this summer. I mean, it should be more clear. It should be starting about now. So I'm telling investors, be cautious. I mean, be out of, of, of stocks and high risk assets especially things like vacation real estate and high-end real estate, which have bubbled the most, and then look to reinvest just a few years from now when this bubble bursts, because this will be the final bubble burst. The tech first, tech, I mean, and here's another history thing real quick. And all of these are explained by, by my cycle. Two bubbles in a technology cycle. The first tech bubble peaked in 2000, 78% crash. Even we, have, we hardly had a recession in, in a longer term boom, 78% because it bubbled up so much and then cracked. Then the long-term peak in baby boom spending, 2007, another big stock crash for even more fundamental reason. And now we have the second tech bubble in that 45-year cycle just peaked, I'd say, in late 2021, and that needs to crash. And then we're done with bubbles, done with bursts, and then we can enjoy the nice millennial boom. It, it will not be as strong as the baby boom um, and, and, and that sort of thing. But it will bring us back. And of course, we're in a global economy. And India, another one of my giant forecasts, and this should be more obvious than it is to more people, India is the next China. And even India doesn't think it is when I go over there and speak, okay? They think they're too backward. India looks exactly like China in the early 80s. Same urbanization, same growing, you know, all this sort of stuff, trends. And they have tons of urbanization to grow, which is a 3x time. 3x for urban people in emerging countries like India, China, Indonesia, that's the biggest driver of growth in the world. And India is gonna do in the next four decades what China did from the early 80s to just recently. And China is gonna have the biggest, he had the biggest bubble, especially in real estate, which is the most powerful and wrecks households the most when it goes down and the economy. China's gonna have the biggest bust and is never going to be the same again. We'll never see real estate and stocks at the highs we've seen. Like, and, and India will be the next great thing along with Southeast Asia. Harry, you have so much to unpack there. So oh. I want to kind of, uh, first I want to say, you started by saying that you dropped out of uh, econ. And uh, first of all, if you were an economist, I don't think that you and I would be talking because I can't get straight answers out of any economist that I've had conversations yeah, they, they, they with. They're two-handed economists. They're always covering because they really don't know how to predict the economy. And, and a lot of them are just, they're saying what their agenda, you know, what, who's supporting them. A lot of them are bureaucrats or they work for bureaucrats and they have a special interest or a reason to tell you one thing or another doesn't mean it's the truth. Uh, but I want to unpack, a lot. you said so much, but I want to unpack it because a lot of what, and, and I'm glad that a lot of people that I speak with think that we're in for complete devastation, that the dollar's going to collapse, that uh, we won't be the superpower anymore, that the U.S. won't be the reserve, the dollar won't be the reserve currency anymore. Um, you're making it seem like at least there's hope at the end of the tunnel. We're going to go through some pain. Uh, a lot of this has been artificially stimulated, um, as has many of the the recessions that we've been led into. And then uh, I've always said, I don't even know what the real meaning of a of, uh, recession is because I feel like the mainstream media kind of talks us into a recession. Oh, guys, now it's time for a recession. And then they talk us out. Well, hey, the recession's over. 
And all the while, like now they're not saying it's a recession, but people have no money. They're paying more than they've ever paid for the life's essentials. But I've heard you say, um, and I want to talk about the interim period because I've heard you go on record for saying that 2024 will be the crash and it will be massive. And you say, you've said things and And I want to preface because I'm bearish too. I'm in the real estate market. I've never seen affordability be so horrible. Eight or nine times uh, median income to get a house. People can't afford that. We've watched the sales slow down, but we've also seen a lack of inventory. And mainstream media wants to paint bears as doomers. And they basically say, you know, they're terrible at predicting crashes, but the the bears are usually right, but you say that 2024 will be a crash. You talk about it being pretty bad. I want to dive into the real estate aspect because you said home prices are so overvalued. They'll never be priced at where they are right now. I've heard you say that on podcasts. You said that we would should expect a 50% price correction on where we are right now. 34, 36%. That would be the highest in U.S. history, even greater than the Great Depression. So let's unpack that. What will be the catalyst for this crash in 2024? Well, well, basically, the catalyst is that the Fed overreacted to a short-term artificial crisis, COVID. I mean, duh, just look back at 1920, influenza, 18 to 20, same thing. Came in, slowed the economy, and then went away. It's a short-term crisis. They they acted like it was the Great Depression. And I, I, I know why they did this. The Fed has had to constantly stimulate the economy since 2009, and they don't know why. It's because the largest generation in history stopped spending and the millennials have not come along to start to replace them yet. They're only doing that now. They don't know why the economy's weak. They just know it is. And so when COVID threatened it, they just panicked. And, and in two years, Todd, between fiscal and monetary, the greatest stimulus in history, $11 trillion stimulus in two years. That's half a GDP. I mean, we should have been grown at 20% for a couple of years after that. That only shows how weak the economy was. But the truth is the Fed doesn't understand why. OK, I've been talking about this since my first book in 1989, but my first best selling book in 93, The Great Boom Ahead. In the roaring 2000s. This is anybody can find my stuff. It's not like hidden or, or nobody's ever heard of it. Economists ignore it because it's not what they were taught. They don't think people matter. I say people drive everything. Young people drive inflationary because they cost everything and produce nothing. People between 20 entering the workforce and their peak in spending and 46 are the biggest single driver of the economy. Always have been. Nobody ever noticed it until this generation got big enough and somebody like me who wasn't an economist tripped along and noticed it. Okay. So, so that's, that's why it is very simple. I mean, I had to do real analysis for fortune 100 companies and then new ventures. And it was the new ventures dealing with the baby boomers, the younger baby boomer customers that woke me up to the baby boom. And then I studied everything about them, how big they are, how they're different, how much they earn and spend. I, we know exactly how much people spend on average at every year of their age and when they peak and when they, and when they peak in investment and when they buy their first home and their main home and their first car and their second car and when they eat for crying out loud the most potato chips. You know what that is, Todd? It doesn't matter. Age 42. It matters that I can predict something that small down to the decimal point. Age 42. Do you know why that is? Average kid born to the average parent, 28, calorie cycle peaks age 14, 42. If I can predict potato chips down to zip codes, my question is what can't you predict in a world I was taught in my major in economics that nobody can predict anything past the next election because it's all political. Paul, I don't even consider who's president in politics unless they start World War III. Hmm. Do you think, I mean, what do you think has changed? You know, when you started uh predicting trends economic trends and the booms and the busts and and very accurately um what has changed geopolitically as far as i mean there's a lot of talk about uh the powers to be and the one world system and you know whether it's the 
the the World Economic Forum? Or, I mean, do you think that's hocus pocus? Do you think there's truth to it? I mean, there's Agenda 21. There's all kinds of of these, uh, you know, and, and it's it's not. Um, this is real stuff. I mean, this is not a, a conspiracy. I mean, you can go into and see planning now in the count down to a state level into a county level and and they talk about 15 minute cities and things like that again this isn't conspiracy but when you look at that does that change your lens when you're from a geopolitical standpoint and knowing that now we're more of a world economy and there and we've got the BRICS nation that is saying that hey you know we don't want to trade in a dollar we look at oil trade uh, i think 2023 was the first year where a hundred percent of oil trade wasn't u.s dollars it was much lower than that maybe 40 percent of oil trade was done with a dollar does that taint your predictions or your perspective or the way that you look at the way things are unraveling well well, well first of all all of these things i and any futures have been talking about globalization for decades that is the biggest trend in the world what I've done is isolated what really counts the most. And you know what, globally, when you count that the, uh, eight, 80% of us or more are in the third world, it's urbanization. Three times the GDP per capita in Brazil or Argentina or, or, or South Africa or China or India. That's where all the people are. Three times from people moving the same person with no more education at first from a rural area into an urban area. So urbanization is the biggest thing that globalization has produced. It's made it easier. Globalization is a trend. Demographics became important. Why? Because Henry Ford created the assembly line in 1914, which suddenly made the average person important because it 10 times their productivity, 10 times the productivity. And that's why he paid them $5 an hour when so many other people were paying them one or two and all this sort of stuff. There was not a middle class before Henry Ford. So technologies shape how affluent we can be, but also generations come in predictable cycles. Strauss and Howell are two people I studied up and down, okay? They studied the political and social impacts. I've studied the financial and economic, okay? impact of new generation. It's huge. And the baby boom was an outsized generation. And the more I look back in history, I said, oh, we actually get an outsized generation about every four, every 250 years. Okay. So, so the more I looked at everything, the more I realized things are very predictable. It's just, you have to know what's important and nobody looks at what's most important. And I is still I, I've had this theory out since 1993, mainstream, okay? I sold hundreds of thousands of books and, 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 and a million of one, okay? It's just like economists still don't pay attention to people spend the most money at age 46. And that's what makes generation cycles way more powerful than they were in the 1800s. And Henry Ford making everyday people middle class only starting in 1914 and emerging in the roaring 20s and the 50s. That's what made the everyday more important and made my generation wave the single best cycle for predicting the economy because even that 100 years ago wouldn't have been as accurate because people weren't as important back then. Everyday people live like kings <laughs> compared to the 1800s and 1700s and then forget going back towards caveman and stuff. So, 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 Things change. Globalization is real. It's only going to continue. But within the globalization, different countries have stronger, weaker demographics. Different countries have they made they're all urbanizing in the third world, but some of them are getting twice the kick out of urbanization because they have better education and better infrastructures, even though they're still third world. But they when they move a person, they go from five to 15,000 GDP per capita and somebody else moving going from two to five. That's a huge difference. Or another country, they go from 15 to 40. That's when they when countries like J uh, uh, East Asia, Japan and South Korea suddenly went from near third world countries to first world countries in a matter of decades. That has been what globalization has been about. Globalization makes trade, access to technology, all it magnifies everything, but I can still zero down on any country and see how are they doing when they urbanize? How is their generation 
wave progressing and how much kick do they get to their economy? Because everybody doesn't get the same kick. We are not all equal as countries historically, culturally, urbanization and everything else. OK, so it makes the whole world more predictable. And most people see all this globalization and say, well, there's more change than ever. And no, no, you don't understand. Globalization and technology are making everything more predictable because we know more about everything. And we've learned this in a matter of decades. Literally, I started my research, demographic research in 1981, when the first consumer expenditure survey made yearly now, the U.S. was published giving this great information, knowing exactly when consumers spend money. I couldn't have even found this out before that. So technology helps us grow smarter. So complexity can actually turn around the other way and, and paradoxically become simple. And you know what the smart people from Steve Jobs to Henry Ford said? Simplicity is the essence. <laughs> OK, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Van Gogh said this. OK, way back. OK, the greatest innovator of his time. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication was his very quote <laughs> way back. OK, because the world is getting more complex. We need to find to get better about deciding what's important and what we can measure to make it more simple and predictable. And I've spent 40 years doing that. And I've basically been ignored by economists because I don't follow their normal stuff, which is why I didn't take economics, because it's not it's not useful. I was looking to predict the world and I found nothing of use in the economics curriculum, except for the theory of how for the first time since the early 1900s, we realized we could create and print money and stimulate the economy. That's the only useful thing I learned in economics. And now that's being abused. It's not healthy <laughs> to constantly stimulate an economy like that. Um, it, it causes money velocity to collapse. Money velocity is the truth indicator, and it will tell you all this boom is going to vanish faster than you think, just like it did in the Great Depression, because it's, it's made out of thin air. It's not fully real. Do you think we'll go through a period of time that's worse than the Great Depression? Probably not because, because I mean, the governments didn't even, I mean, they really did nothing, okay? They just let it happen. And you know what? That's my preference. See, my view is free market capitalism and democracy are two opposites, male and female in nature, that created the greatest explosion from the late 1700s. And it, we've made, seen more progress since the late, those two things happened than all of 300,000 years of, of human history combined and cumulative, okay? That's how powerful this has been. And, 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 and so we just need to learn how to help it. We are fighting it. They just declared in 2009, central banks around the world, and particularly the Fed in the United States, declared war on free market capitalism, okay? And around the world, all types of leaders are trying to suppress democracy. These are the two things that have made the developed countries the richest in all of history in the shortest period of time. And we should be doing more to support this not how do we change that? I mean, how how do we change it? Productivity driver in history. We how do we change power. that, Harry? I mean, how do you get when you have the people that are making all the decisions right now uh, that are against you know, capitalism, free markets, democracy? I mean, there's an argument to say that the way things are going, you know, is <laughs> that they don't want that. Yeah. I mean, well, How and, do you and change that? Don't. Okay, but here's the thing. If you're doing the wrong thing, just like in business, then you're going to eventually fail. You can't, you can't be in the wrong technologies when new technologies are 10 times as good and replacing you and, and, you know, and, and not be replaced by the new leaders. So, so these people, uh, what I'm literally rooting for, and I tell people in my newsletter, I am rooting on this entire money printing BS greatest BS program in history, something for nothing, to absolutely, utterly fail so nobody ever thinks of doing it again and nobody who ever was a proponent of it is ever listened to again. And maybe people start listening. I'm not the only one. There's plenty of people criticizing this, but nobody in the mainstream. Robert Schiller doesn't dare, and he's the best mainstream economist there is. He doesn't dare criticize this machine that's happening. And, and everybody doesn't want a recession recessions are like sleep and waking. You can't have one without the other. And if I look at history, same ratio, about 70% boom, 30% re recession, 70% waking, 16, 18 hours, and 30% sleep. 
They are necessary. We can't live. Try not sleeping. You won't make it three nights without turning into a blabbering idiot. Guaranteed, okay? This is the problem. These people are not going to get it. They, none of them came out of business. Not, not, I said, what, what mainstream economist ever looks like they had sex or run a business? You know, two of <laughs> the most important things people do, okay? No, not a one. Look, at I, there's hardly a one, okay? So, so that's the problem. They're not going to get it. This approach has to fail. And, that, and it has to fail enough that people say, okay. And, and again, I keep reminding my subscribers, and when I give talks, What's happened? Yes, we keep doing this stimulus, something for nothing, money out of thin air. We keep bu bubbling up, but guess what? We keep crashing to new lows every time. So if we bubble up now, globally the most ever, and we crash to new lows one more time, I think the world finally gets it. Unfortunately, we have to fail miserably to get what should be obvious. Printing money out of thin air can be a nice short-term thing to just give the economy a little buoyancy so it doesn't overreact to a crisis. But as an ongoing policy, it's like taking, hey, I could feel really good if I wanted to right now. There's a number of drugs and things I could take and feel really good for the next five, six, seven hours. You just wouldn't want to see me or anybody on these drugs after they come down, okay? It doesn't work to cheat. And, and to feel good artificially. All of our growth since 2008-9 downturn have been 100% from artificial stimulus, not from real productivity, people producing real products, earning real profits, reinvesting those profits. When you do that, you have positive money. That's how you know you're doing that if you don't know otherwise. Money velocity goes up like it did in the 80s and 90s. It's been going straight down the most in all of history since 1998. That is telling you we're doing the wrong thing. And if the stock market's going up, it means the, the stock market's on crack and doesn't know what it's doing. And it's going to take a big fall. When we, when we look at uh, a couple of things, you know, uh, number one, we look at the fact that the history of the United States, I mean, going back to the, the creation of the United States, we, and I've studied this, we have seen what was known as panics, depressions, pandemics, recessions. They used to happen every couple of years. It, they would work themselves out. I mean, there would be something that would happen. It wasn't until we started manipulating. We, we created in, in, in 1913 uh, the Federal Reserve, you know, central bank. And then basically once that happened, they have found ways to – manipulate the market and and basically extend these recessions to be decade long not every two or three years to where it corrects itself things get out they of whack inflate, overinflate booms which then causes overinflated recession and that's what Todd, what a, the, the difference between a depression and a recession, depressions follow bubble booms where things really get wasteful investment and really have to wash out a lot of excesses. In other words, the drunker you get, the worse the hangover. A depression is a deep recession, a hangover, not just a normal. Normal recessions, oh, we'll go up for seven or eight years and then we'll have a 20, 30 percent correction in the stock market, a minor recession. That's normal. The Great Depression followed what? The greatest bubble boom in history up till that point. And that was only similar to the greatest one before that in the 1830s that had a similar 1930s like depression and deep crash. Depressions follow bubble booms. Recessions follow normal booms. So that's the difference between a recession and a depression. This is going to be a short depression from my point of view. And, and what I'm just seeing here, and, and they wouldn't allow this if they could, the Fed overreacted to COVID. That was, and I was saying to my subscribers back then, here's, they finally blew it. They kept this thing under control, just stimulating enough and just blah, 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 blah. They finally went baloney and, and overdid it. And then they had to go do 525 basis points, one of the biggest tightenings in all of modern history. Okay. And We're, that is what's going to burst this bubble. And when it happens, it'll happen so fast. And their credibility will also evaporate so fast that hopefully they can't fight it. And then the economy does in two years what could have been done way back in, 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 in the downturn between 2008 and, and, and 2020. What really should have happened, Todd, in my model, 
We had the first crash 2008 to nine. That should have gone into 2010 and been longer and deeper, washed out a lot more debt. Then we would have come back and then we'd have had one, and just like in the Great Depression, 1929 to 32, super crash, rebound, and then 37 to 38 into 40, a second crash, less or so, and then it's over, okay? So we would have had that second crash to late 2019 into 22 or so, and then the demographics would have started to take us out of this, washing out. I mean, people don't get it. A washout like that makes everything more efficient. And I know this. Here's how I learned this, Todd. My first job, I was working at Bain & Company coming out of Harvard Business School, okay? All we did was turn around Fortune 100 companies that were getting killed by, by European and Japanese, comp particularly Japanese and Asian competition back then. So we have turned around. In a turnaround, things fail. And when things fail rapidly, guess what? That's when you can change things the fastest. And so, but I, I couldn't, I didn't like big companies, they're too bureaucratic. So I did the same Bain-like consulting to small businesses, new ventures, not, I mean, innovative new ventures, not, not local drug stores and state business, okay? Really new, innovative businesses in California. And of course, these things would, would boom like crazy and fail like flies because they're early stage and nobody knows what they're doing and new ventures fail like flies. So that's when I learned, when I was, I would be coming in these companies as, 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 a, as a CEO, and I mean, as a consultant, and then I'd realize, oh, they've got a lot of problems and then they'd start to fail. When things started to fail, I could make six times the change in the same time and could do everything I wanted to do because they were in a crisis and everybody would follow me. And even the people that got laid off were happy I saved the other half of the people in the company, okay? So, so there's nothing wrong with a recession. There's nothing wrong with, with a company failing. Failure is the secret to learning. I, my number one question when I talk to people, what did you learn more, your failures or your successes? People don't even have to think. They don't think that way, no, but when you ask that, they don't even have to think. It's the failures. Failures make you reconsider everything. Successes make you a bigger ego that thinks you're King Tut and, 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 and vulnerable to failure. Successes make you weak over time. And well, what's worse? Companies what, take the biggest hits. What's worse is having a failure and and uh, rewarding it, or just polishing it over, it. printing more, wasting it, right? And and just saying, oh well, well we we made a bad decision. I mean, and I have a problem with that. I mean, really, on fiscal spending. I mean, we're deficit spending like we've never seen before. We have more debt. We're not teaching anybody anything by this. We're wiping out college loans, you know, and giving grants and for things. We're paying for people's mortgages to avoid them from losing their home because they made a bad decision. We entice them to make these decisions. We re, and we we reward and their bad behavior. And then they don't behavior. suffer the, the consequences of good and bad decisions is how we learn. And like I say, there's no question you learn more from failure. So failure is not a problem, but failures should be um, mitigated by reacting to them fast. Once you realize you fail, again, when I was coming from the outside and I wasn't part of the company and a company's failing, I could make massive changes, really productive changes in a short period of time. So, so that's a secret. Change requires boom and bust. And yes, we do boom more than we bust, and that's why we grow over time. But pe for people to think the answer is to have less recessions and never have a recession means you really, really, really don't understand innovation and how we grow. Failures are essential to growth. And, and, and the best entrepreneurs have always said, you know, we fail, 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 fail. Going, uh, one guy literally said, a successful entrepreneur, the process is going enthusiastically from failure to failure because the failures are what create greater successes because you learn so much and you see opportunities and failures you don't see when you're falling asleep from your successes. I've always said fail fast. I mean, fail, fail fast, right get it fast. over with. Get, get it out of the way and let's, let's get on to the, to the, the boom. But, let, so, but the issue here is the, the system that we've built it allows people to make decisions, their own decisions. They can print money out of thin air. They can expand the debt. They can give stimulus like they've never done before. I mean, we didn't, when, since when did we start bailing out corporate America? And when, I guess when we realized that their implication of their failure would make things even more catastrophic. I've always said that money is the only thing that defies gravity because if, if you can print money out of thin air, 
or maybe it's not even money, it's currency. There's argument to that, right? Valid argument. But what happens, you print this currency, everybody wants it. Your middle and lower class wants the stimulus. They want the, the airplane money. And then what happens is they don't even realize that it puts them in a worse position. We know that by the amount of debt right now after the most stimulus we've seen. But what happens is that seems to rise up. The currency defies gravity, rises up into the riches, uh, you know, uh, the, the coffers of the rich. But getting back to the recession, because no one wants to see the recession on their watch. And when you look at, you can take Obama, took office, he he adopted the GFC, fell right into his lap, right? Um, he had to d- make decisions that were n- never seen before. The largest housing market crash uh, that we've seen since post-World War II. But when we look at it and we say, okay, here we are, we're in a bigger bubble, we're a bigger bubble than I mean, you just said we created a bigger bubble to solve the first bubble. That is not a solution. And that's showing we did the wrong thing, why we were incentivized to do the wrong thing. And if we were doing the right thing, money velocity would have turned around and and, and validated it. And it's only gone straight down. Yeah. So what happens? Is this going to are we going to see this? A lot of people say with the election year being in November that this current administration, the Fed, has already planned rate cuts. We've already seen that. They didn't raise rates enough. I mean, this, people have still gone like crazy, though the economy is starting to slow. Will we see this crash before the election or after January 1? And then will we see this disinflation that is apparent? And disinflation sucks because that means prices aren't going down. It just means if you wait long enough, oh, of course you're going to have disinflation. You slow the economy and you give it more time. Hey, then we we have disinflation year over year. But it's not deflation what people really need. Will we see disinflation that results in stagflation? Or as a result of this crash, will we actually see deflation so will it last until november and will we see more of the same or deflation well will it last till november is the question mark obviously nobody in the system fed or or politics wants that to happen so they're going to try not to but again despite that because they overreacted to COVID, which they did nobody would have blamed them if things slowed over COVID. it's a natural thing okay they overreacted now they've already i mean 525 basis points if that doesn't cause a slowing into the election in early next year, then something's really wrong. So it's likely that this die has already been cast. What it says is that's going to hurt the incumbent. If the economy keeps getting slower rather than better, um, then, then that's going to hurt the incumbent uh, and, 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 and Biden in, in favor of Trump or whoever gets the Republican thing. OK. Um, what, what the truth is, we're not the only sign that the economy is taking back over and doing what it needs to do to get healthy again is deflation. We've only had lower inflation. Deflation happened in the 1930s. That's a sign that we're flushing out bad assets, bad investments to free up capital to go into the new and better investments. OK. Failure is failure is making the way for the best companies to get capital and to move forward with less competition. That's what free market capitalism does. Free market capitalism gives the freedom for everybody to innovate, okay, and let everybody do it. A thousand flowers bloom, but then capitalism is ruthless in clearing out the losers rapidly down to the few that really prove. Because the because the free market system knows we don't know who's going to be the general motors. Ford looked like the General Motors, okay? Even, even late into the cycle, and still General Motors kicked them in the roaring 20s and became number one forever after that, okay? So the economy doesn't know. It just knows how to create innovation, and, uh, and but it also means you have to be as ruthless about shaking out the losers. We're creating the winners. We're not letting the losers, forcing the losers to get out of the way, and so we got a big traffic jam, okay? We got a clogged highway here. OK, we can't optimize growth when governments around the world won't let anything or anybody or any business fail. Failure. George Gilder is my favorite. and He's pretty old now. Favorite modern day economist. He says failure is equally important to free market capital. Everybody underrates it. Everybody looks at the innovation and success. OK, failure 
And the freedom to allow failure is equally important. And that's what we're failing at. We're failing at failing. Let's get back to the housing market as we kind of close out here. Uh, you know, that's my business. I've been serving the housing industry since 1989. I started in construction, built houses, uh, you know, I was a contractor. Um, the worst affordability housing crisis we've ever seen. It's crazy. I mean, it really is. Even when we were going through the GFC, the peak of pricing, home pricing in 2006, we never dropped below the uh, the line of where a median income earner could buy still a median income or a median priced home. Uh, this is terrible. You say that we could be looking at home prices crashing 50 percent what would be the catalyst to that well the prices start to fall and that helps trigger a recession and then the recession triggers see that's how things things build positive loops on the upside they build negative loops on the downside the best question is asked who does that benefit when house prices drop 50 percent oh how about the young millennials just entering the economy and just getting married and having kids and cannot afford those houses like you say who does it hurt the aging baby boomers who've had their ass kissed by rising house prices and had a uh, heaven fall over the head for way longer than they deserve and now they own way they were you know they're living in a mcmansion with no kids in it okay and won't sell it because it'll because they think they don't want to lose the gains it's going to go up forever if this will cause the whole economy to shift bring housing back to affordability because what what good is the economy's growing and we're making some more money if housing is still more and more unaffordable for the people who need to buy them which is the young new families people buy the first house typically 26 now that's 36 okay for millennial okay? and they buy their main house at the largest house at 42 before they peak in spending before their kids leave the nest because they want to be in the best high school um, now that's 56 so, so a millennial, you know, the young people today can't afford to buy their main prize house until their kids have left them, and they don't need any. I mean, it, it's it's insanity. All of this is insanity. It's happened because nobody wants to accept failure. Nobody wants a recession. We've now gone 14 years since the last recession started. Um, the longest by far, the longest it's ever been is 10. Um, you know, we've had a bubble that stretched longer and bigger than, than even 95 to 2000 and 25 to 29 and 1830 to 35. I mean, th this is just everything. If you look at history, people can look back and say, and I'm going to quote this, what were they smoking? <laughs> How could you be this blind not to see a bubble this big and obvious? And I keep throwing that money velocity chart. This is, if you don't believe anything else, this is the truth meter, and it is screaming it off the rooftops. This is not unambiguous at all. And, and again, the Great Depression followed, what was it, 70, 12, 13 years of rapidly falling money velocity, which included a bubble boom. Bubble booms are not a good sign, folks. And this one's bigger, and this drop has been longer and deeper. This, everything is screaming this, and everybody's like, well, as long as we're still high, who cares? We are high. This sort of overgrowth and easy economy and below, you know, artificially low interest, oh, low interest rates make you give you twice the home for the same payment. That's cheating. That's artificial. It's fine if it's if it's true long term, but it's been pushed that way. It's been made that way artificially. So we're living on artificial drugs. When people take artificial drugs like Super coffee, alcohol, name your pick, okay? Anything you want to take. Do they get smarter or dumber? Do they get healthier or weaker? They feel better than ever, and then they get less healthy and weaker, as predictable as the sun coming up. That's what we're doing here. And nobody will call it that. The Fed won't call it that. Robert Schiller will barely call that. Economists don't have the guts to see the obvious. This is obvious. You don't get something for nothing. And we've had decades now of a boom that just goes up. And every time things go down, government just print money out of thin air. <laughs> okay. I'm feeling bad. I can feel real good. I said, you get, get, take your choice of drug. 
anybody can feel good for the next five, six, seven, eight hours. But you will pay for it, okay, if you do it artificially. So, so our, you really my, believe- my conclusion is we're going to pay big for this, and people aren't going to understand until it happens. And then you know what people will do, Todd? People will say, how could have we been so stupid? <laughs> how could have we not seen it? When a bubble burst, it is so obvious that the oh. people who got high, and being high makes you stupid, okay? You're going to do stupid things. And when people wake up, they go, how could have I done that? How could have we been so stupid? Yeah. So you think house prices are really dropped 50%? You think yeah. house prices? They dropped 34 on average from 2006 to 12. That was more than the 26% in the Great Depression with 25% unemployment because housing was not a part of the bubble back then because mortgage loans for five years and, yeah. and and fifty percent down. There was yeah, no way balloon to payments yeah. like today. And you right. couldn't, couldn't get a loan back then. Okay, who who was just walking, you know, and 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 so 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 stocks had a crash in the realm we're going to see here. And I'm predicting eighty six percent it worse for the S and P and ninety two percent for the Nasdaq. That's wow. why the eighty nine percent Dow crash. But housing is what's different this time. Housing didn't bubble, but but modestly in the roaring 20s housing bubbled this time as much or more mm. than stocks and for housing to go down 50 percent is way worse than stocks to go down 89 percent because people have mortgages against that and it's it's critical to their living situation Where it's gdp it's 35 percent I mean, housing, I mean, when you look at housing and related how, housing related costs, it could be 35 percent of GDP. So if you're talking about a crash of 50 percent in home values, we're talking about a crash, massive crash of high unemployment. Uh, there would be so much bankruptcy and destruction. And here's what really worries me about the whole thing. And, and look, I wasn't calling 50 percent, but I see what you're talking about. And I tell you, you've been at this a lot longer than me. I've been in the trenches you know, uh, just worrying about job to job to job for years, but I'm seeing it. I see where the affordability has never been worse. I'm seeing where people are taking now over 50% of their income to their house payment. Yeah, They're buying houses. They're going to their house payment. That is not good. Not good. Not good. But I tell Another you what. That's an obvious sign that everybody's ignoring. Well, it's okay because it's going to keep going up. Yeah, it'll keep going up until it doesn't. And, and I'll tell you what. I know what a bubble lot, and I put it in my books and my newsletter so everybody can see it. You look at the male orgasm chart from Masters and Johnson, that is exactly what a bubble looks like. And orgasms go up and they get great, then they just get euphoric, then what do they do? They drop like a rock. I mean, and men know this better than women, okay? We don't get three, okay, or four or whatever. We get one and then we're dead, okay? And, and that's what happens. And that's why it becomes so obvious when it happens. But all you got to do is look at these markets. And when they go like this, they look just like I, I put my orgasm chart literally over a lot of these bubbles just to show people this is what it looks like. Make no mistake. If you think this is not a bubble, then you are blind and you're ignoring every bubble in history because this is exactly what they look like. That's a great point. We and they only burst. There is no and has never been a soft landing for any bubble. Once it gets to that extreme, there is no way to let out the air slowly. Well, I mean, that's a lot uh, A lot said, a lot of great advice and wisdom. And all of your information we drop below in the show notes, your newsletter. We encourage people, go ahead right now, check out the, the show notes below. Uh, subscribe to Harry's YouTube channel, his newsletter. Uh, he has Harry's rant. Uh, you know, a lot of... Look, you have to look at what Harry is saying here as um, this doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. Everybody wants to turn their head to it. Mainstream media is controlled. I mean, it, you know, look, there's it, it, this is agenda. It, it, they're not going to come out for obvious reasons and say we are in really dire straits. Because that would only pre precipitate the crash faster. Correct. They, yeah, they, you can't yeah. get any wisdom from mainstream. Everybody's vested in the bubble now. You have to listen to outsiders. And simply, you're not going to change this. I'm not going to change it. 
All you do is get out simply by moving out of risky real estate and particularly stocks, okay, which are very easy to sell in a moment, okay, at these unbelievably high historical prices and just get out of the way and let this thing happen, whether it takes a year or three years and faster or slower, let it happen. And then you'll be, you'll, the world will be your oyster, the, your money that you protected or even enhanced by being, and by the way, the safe haven is not gold. Do not listen to Peter Schiff on this one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay? Gold will only go down 50% when stocks go down maybe 90. But it's the 30-year and 10-year treasury bonds, the safest long-term bonds, the long-term leverages, the returns, the, the, all the money does go into that safe haven asset as it did in 2008. And look at 2020. That was a brief recession. Treasury bonds went straight up while everything else went down. This is an everything bubble. The only thing that goes up is long-term treasury bonds. So you not only can protect your money, you can have it actually appreciate in the downturn. And then, and I'm, and people keep telling me, Harry, you're telling me, that's like I'm telling them to buy treasury bonds for the next 20. I'm telling you to buy treasury bonds for the crisis the next year or two. That's it. You go back in and buy real estate and stocks when they come back to not just, not from high values, but to bargain values again to the lowest values you'll see in your lifetime. Then you can buy those and hold them and be a normal investor. If you listen to most, and, and I love financial advisors because they're objective, and I've worked with them most of my career. Not now, okay? They're gonna tell you to hang in there, rebalance that up. No, that's not gonna work. You don't come back from an 89% stock loss or 50% <laughs> real estate crash. You do not come back, especially if you had an 80, 90% mortgage. So Harry, what you're saying is for people out there, and that's great advice, what you're saying for people with housing, if they're in the housing market, they should probably hold off. And the other uh, takeaway here that I want to kind of uh, give the audience is what about cash? What about the cash? Because I've heard you say that cash is good in a, in a yeah, crash. It's good. So I mean, Treasury bonds are best because they appreciate cash, protect cash, protects your money. It holds it while everything else goes down, which means your cash will buy a lot more. So cash is good. Treasury bonds are great. Longest term treasury you want. If you had to buy one thing, I'd buy a 30 year treasury bond. And again, this is only a crisis short term investment next year to two. OK, it's not I'm not telling you to buy 30 year treasury bonds at a measly four and a half percent yield forever. I'm telling you to buy them for this crash because they might even double in value because they're the mm -hmm. only safe haven. If you don't believe that, look at 2008 and look at 2020. What went up when everything else crashed, especially all sectors of the stock market? So, and so there's no place to hide. Um, there's better places than not. There's there's staple stocks that may go down 40 percent instead of 80. OK, that's still not good. OK, gold will go down 40 to 50 instead of 80 to 90 like stock. That's Peter's so not going to be happy. He's not going to be happy with you on that one. <laughs> it's, I know, I know. You guys share an island too. <laughs> you, guys, you both live That's in Puerto Rico. Hey, Peter and I agree on the magnitude of the bubble, magnitude of the crisis. He's, I see treasury bonds as a safe haven. He sees gold. To me, that shouldn't even be an argument. I'm sorry, Peter, because 2008 and 2020, the last two flash crashes, just proved what goes up. Gold goes up in the early stages thinking it's going to be the safe haven when things get really bad. Gold went down like 40 percent in 2008 when things really got bad. And I tell you, that was still not a bad place. That was one of the better places to be, but was not the best place to be. Well, would it would it be fair enough to end this on uh, your opinion on Bitcoin? So now that you're talking about cash and gold yeah. and treasury, Absolutely. I mean, what do you think about Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin, that a Ponzi? People are saying Bitcoin's a safe haven. Absolutely not. OK, Bitcoin is the net is part of the next big thing. I didn't get it till somebody speaking to my Mark uh, Yusko speaking at my own conference years ago said, so this crypto is the digitization of all financial assets of, and money in the world. I'm like, oh my God, that's not, you couldn't be bigger than that. It's a part, it's a risk asset, okay? It's the biggest risk asset. So it's the last thing I wanna own in the crash and the first thing I wanna buy. If Bitcoin goes back down to recent lows, like 15, 16,000 or even lower, that'd be the first thing I'd be buying in, in a crash, but I am not 
even thinking of riding out this crash, thinking Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency is a safe haven. They've already proven they're not. They go up the most like risk and they go down the most. What's going down the most so far? Stock market's making new highs. Bitcoin's already been down substantially, you know, just recently. And, and, and then before that, you know, it, it led the crash on the way down. So after 21, so, so it's a risk asset, but it is the next big thing. Basically to revamp and in a time where the world's going to be even more affluent than ever and more even everyday people are going to have substantial financial assets. What could be more important than something that restructures and makes far more efficient and dynamic everything that has to do with money and financial assets? And what would be the best standard for a global money standard? Would it be gold? No, it would be Bitcoin. The largest standard of this movement, because Bitcoin, other, other cryptos are actually useful and do something. Bitcoin, I think, is groomed to be the gold, the gold standard for the digital world a few decades from now. Well, Harry Dent, we appreciate you. You're amazing. Thank you so much. And I look forward to doing this again soon and riding out the next 12 months or so. We'll see. It's going to play out. Hindsight's always 2020. Yeah. I appreciate you. Okay. Thanks again, Todd. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up. It'll let Harry and me know that you did. And if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, take a minute, do so now. Hit that alert bell. You'll know every time we upload content just like this. Guys, I really would appreciate hearing your thoughts and comments on what you expect to happen this year as we're heading into the election, as well as your thoughts on the housing market. What would it look like to you if home prices dropped 50%. And something you could do for me personally to help us get the word out would be to share this content, this video with your family and friends. It'll help the algorithms, it'll help spread the word, and people will learn what is really going on from experts like Harry, as opposed to what you're not hearing in mainstream media. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland broker number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.